This is Tom Rust for TRSB Sports Podcast. Today, delighted to be joined by boxing promoter John. How you doing, mate? I'm good, Tom. How you doing, mate? Yeah, all good, thank you. We were just speaking before we started recording. Sounds like you've been a busy man. Yeah, really busy. Just uh, announced another card today. Got quite a few shows coming up in the summer. So we've done, I'm sure we'll talk about it in a minute, but we've done three shows now, but we've got four booked in over about a six, seven week period. So just seem to got the momentum and keep going with it. Yeah, we were talking about your June 4th card as well, Brentwood Centre Essex. We was there in February. Absolutely brilliant event from top to bottom. It was a you know, great card. A touch of class about it as well. So fingers crossed we're looking nice. uh, to come back on the 4th. Um, looking forward to another good night. Yeah, brilliant. Um, just before we crack on as well, um, of course, a massive event only a few nights ago, Wembley, London, Tyson Fury in front of, in front of 94,000 people. Just want to get your reaction to the fight. Yeah, he's a good question, actually. He's he, he's a rock star in terms of everything about him, and he's easily the best heavyweight out there. Uh, definitely the best of his generation. I had some casual fans of mine who aren't ma- uh, mates of mine who aren't massive boxing fans, but watched it, and it was like I thought it was really boring. And I was like, it was anything but boring. He just couldn't get a glove on him, so they, it wasn't competitive. So maybe for a casual, it wasn't as good. But I just thought it was a masterclass, uh, and that knockout punch was superb. But brilliant performance. I didn't. I expected him to win. Um, I wouldn't have been shocked if Dillian won, because I think Dillian, I had him probably before the night, if you asked me to put it in order, probably had Dillian as number three um, in the in the rankings in the world. That would have been my, obviously, opinion, but he's definitely up there. But he just showed his class. I'd be interested to see him against Usyk, because Usyk is a similar style. He's elusive. Uh, some might argue that Usyk's uh, defensive and boxing skills are even better than that of Fury. I think the size would be too telling, but I don't think there's anyone out there uh, in his generation now um, that beats him. Yeah, watching the fight, um, I was thinking, I wonder what White's going to do, come out southpaw, uh, a little bit strange. But for me personally, never really got a foothold in the fight. He threw some big shots, but Tyson Fury just seemed like he saw them coming a mile away. Just couldn't really, really couldn't really get a glove on him, could he? No, spot on. And I, I'm not sure, because again, the day after, everyone was telling me how rubbish they thought Dillian was. And I was like, he wasn't great. But was Dillian really rubbish or was Tyson just that good? And then if you put it into context, if you look at the trilogy with Deontay Wilder, I believe uh, Fury won the first one of that. That was a draw. I think most do think that. And then he definitely won the next two, as we know. But it just shows maybe how good Wilder is because a lot of people, including myself, I used to think, oh, he's amazing with this one-punch power. Then he comes up against Tyson and I'm like, oh, he's not as good as he was. But I think Tyson himself, was it yesterday or today? He said that he thinks that because uh, he's saying he's retiring and we'll wait and see on that. But he's saying that he believes Deontay Wilder should get a shot of the winner of Usyk uh, Joshua, which I think is a good shout because he's probably proven that he's levels above Dillian White. If if you look at their two performances, at least he gave more of an account of it. But you're right, he couldn't land on him. Fury was too big, he was too clever. And then when he, when he wanted to finish it off, he did it. What did you make of the push after the uppercut? There's been a lot said about that since... Yeah, I mean, he did push him a little bit. I mean, do I think... I'm not sure on the actual definitive rule. I don't think you... You're never going to get a point deducted for a slight bit of push and shoving. Some of the things you see, you see a lot worse. Uh, it did feel a little bit maybe a sour grapes, you know, stuff I was reading yesterday. It's just, if, if it was yeah. me, I mean, Dylan White's an amazing boxer. You know, I've never been in a ring, so who dare am I to criticise anyone? But I probably would have just took my hat off and went, I definitely got beaten by the better fighter, uh, rather than come out with reasons as to why... The punch itself was just amazing. He got up and then he was just wobbled. The ref was right. He, he shouldn't He shouldn't have carried on. Yeah, it's definitely a no-fit state to continue. He was all over the place. I did feel for him. I'm a big, I'm a big white fan. I think he's a great character in and out of the ring. But like you, like you were saying, it's got to be a hard one. With, with boxing as well, it's just you and your opponent. It's not like you play for a football team and there's 10 other blokes you can maybe point the finger at or blame or... Or whatever, you've got to take it on the chin, excuse the punt. But I'm sure yeah. he'll come again. But Tyson Fury, do you think he'll fight again? I think so. I think Tyson is a character. I think that he's unpredictable in everything he does. So I'm not saying he's a liar, but I wouldn't be surprised if he has no intention of retiring. I think he I could see why he might think it. Does Usyk give him much more trouble than White? 
probably not. It might be a different puzzle for him to solve, but he's too big for him. Um, I believe that Fury beats Joshua. I'm not sure Joshua's as good as he was um, since his first defeat to Ruiz. I think he looks a little bit nervous when someone's throwing combinations on him. But I think that fight, if you're talking money, and if Joshua's got all the belts back, I think Frank Warren come out today saying he thinks that fight makes 200 million. It wouldn't surprise me if it did. Anthony Joshua has worldwide global appeal. Um, you know, I've said this many a time on interviews. I can sit on the sofa with the missus and she'll be drooling over him. And then her grandma, who's like in her <laughs> 70s, she'll be drooling over him. And it, it, he has that. About there. Um, that fight makes money sense. I do think, again, Fury's too good there. Um, is there anyone else in the division for him to fight other than Usyk or Joshua? Probably not. I mean, you look at the next crop coming through. Joe Joyce, I think that would be a good fight. You know, Joe, I'm a big Dubois fan and I know Dubois really well. And when Joyce beat him, I was not shocked, shocked, but the, the manner in which he did, I think Joyce is really hard to beat. And his upcoming fight against Parker will be very interesting. Um, and then maybe Dubois himself, a couple more fights down the line. They're younger. He's learned by the looks of it since his defeat uh, to Joyce. But they're probably too far away yet to fight him and by which time he will have retired by then. So I can see why he's saying it. And do you think if we have this conversation in 20 years' time and we look back and Fury um, is not to fight again, do you feel like we can class him as the best of an era be because, you know, he's been there with Klitschko. I think you said as well, you, you know, in your opinion, you think he beat um, Wilder on, on all three occasions. Of course, he's beat White. Maybe you wouldn't put White, you know, at the same level as the, the those two. But do you think he needs to beat Usyk to be considered the best of the, you know this generation of heavyweights? I do. It's a great question. I think you, you've asked the question there. I think he does. And I'll tell you why. He's definitely the best of a generation. You can only beat what's in front of you in your generation. You know, some people slate the Klitschko's, but they reign supreme. So you have to put them in that conversation. I think uh, Tyson Fury went over and took the belt or belts from Tyson Fury in his own backyard. When not, Sorry, from Klitschko in his own backyard in Germany when he was relevant. Um and that was, that was a masterclass there. He then obviously went through what he went with his personal issues and put in the Wayne gain and then came back. That's a proper like story that in itself, just to come back, let alone to then go on and dominate the division. Um, I just think that whilst he's still in his prime and there's one or two fighters out there that he could fight, I think you should do that to cement a legacy. So, you know, when you look at some of the opponents you've just mentioned, Deontay Wilder has probably proved how good he actually was on the back of the Dillian White performance. But outside of that, Dillian White, John Tay Wilder, Klitschko in his prime, admit, well, not maybe in his prime, but certainly when he was good. Outside of that, I'm not really sure. So if Usyk's there, why wouldn't you just go and beat him? And if Joshua wins the belts, why wouldn't you just go and beat Joshua? And then I think you can put him in that conversation with Lennox Lewis. Um you know, Vander Holyfield, Mike Tyson's, Muhammad Ali's, they're the kind of ones I put in that elite bit. I would say if you beat Susik or Joshua or both, then yes. I think as well, um, you know, personally, Tyson Fury, he always turns it on. When it's a big occasion, he turns up every single time. You know, like you were saying, he went to Germany, got the belts off Klitschko, went over to America after the back of, you know, mental health struggles, losing all the weight. Wembley in front of 94,000 people. If that was me, I'd, I'd, I don't think I'd be able to make it out of the changing room, but he just he just turns it on. But I think you're right. I think if he does decide to call it a day and then six months down the line after the Joshua fight, whatever the outcome of that is, when you're offered so much money and, of course, if you feel like you can go and win that fight, it's got to be a difficult, a difficult opportunity to turn down. Yeah, I think when you look at some of the others that we just mentioned in this conversation, like Lennox Lewis, for example, when you think your time is up, it's up. After that performance Saturday night, he's in his prime. Um, so why wouldn't you just get one or two more fights? But equally, he's done everything he can. He's earned his money. He might be one of those that's happy to just go off into the sunset believing, which he certainly does, that he is the best of all time. And in his mind, I don't need to go and beat Usyk just because some idiot like John <laughs> thinks I do. And there, there'll always be people with opinions, but He's definitely going to be mentioned in that uh, conversation for many decades to come. Yeah, no, it's a good point, I suppose. Where, where do you, when, you know, when do you stop? You know, you, you, there's never going to be a point where someone is not throwing a name at you that they think, you know, you maybe need to to be. 
But coming back to you, mate, again, I know you've been a busy man. So how is life as a boxing promoter? Yeah, it's good. Thanks, Tom. It's been busy. Um, our last event was at Cardiff. So we did the Brentwood one, which was a great success, as you mentioned. And thanks for the feedback there. Cardiff was really good as well. Uh, we've tried to bit, make a bit of our name of our production. Um, and I'm sure you'd agree from the Brentwood one that trying to make it a really good event for the fans as well. And that feedback we're getting. Um, so by demand, if I'm honest, as much as we want to do it, everyone's like, we're having fighters banging the door and trainers, can we get on your shows? Can we get on? And then I'm like, well, why wouldn't we do more? So we're out on the 4th of June in Brentwood, cards assembled, tickets are out there. I think that's four weeks or so to go now. So the fighters are right into camp. And um, we were excited about that. We're then three weeks later, we got Cardiff. A week after that, we're at York Call, our first time at York Call. I'm excited about that because of, it's iconic, isn't it? And everybody thinks the same. So uh, that'll be good for us. And then we're, in Maidstone a couple of weeks after. Uh, so I've got four events um, coming up and they're all quite close together. So, you know, in terms of the small hall stuff and one minute you're speaking to a ticket company about promoting, uh, printing tickets, then I'm dealing with a negotiation on the production elsewhere. And then I've got a fighter who can't be on this card because they got a little knock. Can you put me on the next card? There's always something going on, but no, it's very exciting, busy, but exciting. Yeah, you know, we, we talk about these huge events at Wembley, 94,000 people, but equally, small hall shows and yeah going back to one you did in Brentwood was was brilliant you know the the ring walks were were amazing they weren't rushed either you know it weren't like the fighters were just standing there for a couple of seconds coming out you know it was really helping build the atmosphere the lighting the ring girls the whole you know the whole occasion was 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 brilliant so if you're definitely free June the 4th I, I highly recommend you you know you go down there and enjoy a good night of boxing good man and we was hoping to have your co-boxing uh, promoter on. Um, I, I don't know whether he's having a few technical problems, but I was just going to ask you how you know each other and how you sort of come to this decision. Because, of course, we hear a lot in boxing that it can be a, um, you know, a hard place to work in sometimes. So how did you sort of come up with the idea and like, what was the process behind actually getting into the promotional world? Yeah, it's a shame he's not on. I'm not sure what happened. He's normally the techie one, unlike me. So I'm not sure if he's. I was spoken <laughs> five minutes before. So I'm, I was half expecting him to just jump on now. Well, at least we've um, got one of you. Yeah, exactly. And a better looking one, of course. Um, <laughs> I, I, I've known Obviously. Aaron since he, he, he was a young lad. Um, you mentioned it's hard work. It genuinely is. If you saw what goes on behind the scenes, and I have a full-time job as well, which pays the bills. So trying to find time to do stuff, doing it on your own would be very hard. Secondly, it can be a very lonely place um, in terms of trying to do it if you haven't got a team around you. So Aaron and I formed the company. I've known Aaron since he was probably about 10 and he's, what is he now, about 27. So he's about 15 years younger than me. It's like a little brother kind of thing. And uh, he loved the sport. He grew up watching it with me kind of thing. He's a very close family friend. His, his mum, who sadly passed away, was a very good friend of mine. And he'd sort of like watch boxing with me. And I said, look, do you want to do it? And he was like, I'd love to. So I've kind of was working in the sport like yourself for two or three years doing interviews. And then I always fancied trying to be a promoter. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to give it a bash. Uh, no one said it'd be easy. I didn't think it would be. And it isn't. But certainly having the two of us do it. You also sort of like those highs and lows, you know, that you mentioned and really nice feedback again about Brentwood. The overall all result is amazing but the blood sweat and tears that goes into it you've got someone there on your lows you've got someone there on your even my wife you know she loves to see that I've been successful it's going well but she don't really understand the detail that I'm doing every day so it's good I'll give another mention out we got Sarah and I we are the co-promoters but we have a guy who works for us called Abdul um and to be honest he does just as much work as the two of us yeah, yeah we met he, him really he nice Oh, you have met him? Yeah, good. He is a top fella. He's actually got a son, Jaheed, who's a professional fighter himself. He's one and oh. He's taking a little break. Uh, he's they got Ramadan at the moment. Um, and once Ramadan's out of the way, we're hoping that Jaheed will be back as well. Um, so that's good for Abdul, but he, he he loves getting involved with it and he really helps us out with the fighters and stuff like that. Yeah, it sounds like you know, you we we talk to lots of boxers and we talk about camps and sacrifices they make. It's you know, equally equally for you. Come fight night, you put all the hard graft in and that's like the final, uh, the polished version of, you know, your event. But of course, there's lots that go on behind the scenes, like you touched upon as well, like boxers getting injuries, people pulling out sometimes or maybe just want to be put on a further show because they might not be in the, the best shape possible. But how important is it for you to work with someone that you sound um, quite close with? Because I imagine... Now, like any business or any venture, you want to be comfortable with the person that you're working with and you want to be able to share ideas and be able to disagree without falling out as well. 
Yeah, it's a really good question. It's almost like you bugged our phones or something because <laughs> we have arguments. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, we, we have arguments, Aaron and I, around decisions or someone who might not have done as much as the other one because it is a stressful world. Uh, I think the biggest thing when I decided to do it and I did it with Aaron, there was never, ever going to be an issue of trust. I mentioned he's like a brother. I'd almost say he's more like a son. Um, I'm that close with him. So I don't have any concern there. But the sacrifices we do have to do, because I work all day, every day, five, six days a week. So I spend my evenings doing boxing. So whether that's speaking to trainers, fighters, on days off, I have to go to gyms and stuff. So I sacrifice family life and I've got loads of kids myself. So there's definitely a sacrifice that I and Aaron have to do. I think Aaron at the weekend, he was due to do something. I was away on holiday for a week. I was only down in Devon, but we had to deliver the tickets to the fighters for Brentwood. And a lot of the small hall promoters, what they do is they get a ticket allocation, not knocking them off the fighters, and they send them in the post. Sometimes they've never met them. Whereas yeah. I take pride, as does Aaron and Abdul, in building the relationships with the fighters. So Aaron and Abdul were sort of like driving all over Essex and Kent delivering tickets at the weekend, which might not seem like much, but the fighters appreciate it. And it gives us that face-to-face -face kind of contact and building the relationships so that that not only do they think, oh, that was a good show with good production and or it was on IFL or whatever it was, but uh, John Aaron and Abdul, they're good fellas as well. Yeah, I think like again, like any event or any business, it's doing those little things that for, for boxers that make a big difference. You know, it, and when boxers actually turn up at an event and to see you straight away and know who you are, I couldn't imagine being a fighter turn up at an event and not even know who the boxing promoter is. It happens. And, and I, I genuinely think that sometimes, well, not sometimes, most of the time, fighters just think the, the promoters earn loads of money and that we're super rich. I can tell you now, my missus looks at me when I tell her how much I haven't made or even maybe lost. It's like, really? What are you doing it for? That actually getting to build relationships with them makes them feel like that they're important rather than just oh here comes the promoter because what we do when they sell their tickets we obviously take a percentage they have their cut we have ours and that has to pay for the bills but i suppose if you're a fighter you might be thinking you're not getting in the ring being punched i just turn up on the night and you're here because they don't see the sacrifices and the work we have to do uh, so it's a good acknowledgement from you you're spot on in what you're saying yeah, I feel like, you know, going back to your partner again, you definitely need the right sparring partner, if you like. Like, I do this podcast with Shane, and we're quite like-minded. He's a little bit older than I am. But we can talk about things, we can discuss things, we can disagree, but, you know, we, we sort of work it out. And I just feel like I couldn't do this with someone that was maybe a little bit fiery or um, too sort of argumentative, because, you know, you do it, I think, initially because you enjoy it. But, of course you know, like what we do, I spend a lot of time in the evening reaching out to boxers and often my wife is like, I'll oh, put that bloody thing down, you know, are you going to come downstairs? And I'm like, I'll just give it five minutes and then two hours later, you know, I might go down. So it does take a lot of time. Obviously you're doing a lot more than we do, but um, it's definitely time consuming. We, we play to each other's strengths as well. There's so many things that you have to do to get a show on the going that some of us are better than others at certain things. So, you know, Aaron's very techy. He's very good on. Granddad with tech and stuff like that. So I just let him and Abdul get on with that because they're better at it. Um, you know, if I've got a better relationship with a certain gym or a certain manager or another promoter, I'll go and do that. Um, but we definitely try and work to each other's strengths because that's probably the best thing to do. Yeah, no, 100%. Yeah, I think you're spot on. You know, Shane will sometimes say something kind of like, do you know what? I didn't even think about that. So, having two heads rather than one is, is definitely helpful. But the, for the shows you've done so far, how do you reflect on them and, you know, looking at the good things that have come out of them and maybe things that you want to improve on going forward? Very good question. So the first one was in Northampton and it was just like, you know what, I want to follow my dream and be a boxing promoter. I almost saw I can take it to the grave and go, I tried. Uh, let's see how we get on. And it, it wasn't quite as big an event as Brentwood or Cardiff. But for my first one, I managed to, again, I had some good relationships from doing the work that you do. And I managed to get um, like one or two names on there that were very good prospects. And people were like, wow, how'd you do that? We sold it out in Northampton with a thousand fans in the theatre there. So it was sort of like, wow, that worked. The feedback was great. Then we went on to Brentwood, um, which was a bigger card. There's more eyes on it. There's more profile. We get a lot of time now spending replying to people which is great because you know we have different fighters reaching out you know promoters different um media people like yourself who want our time etc so it is it is busy but in terms of probably what went well is the feedback we've had and the shows um the brentwood one in particular 
you, you can put a card together that looks amazing on paper and sometimes the fights are just crap. That we were we were blessed that the two main fights you had Jack Martin against Liam Wells, which was a war. You were there, um, and Jack got the better of Liam on the night, which was you know it was a 50 50 fight. They both took that fight, which was credit to those two lads. And then people forget about that because the one afterwards for the English title, which was Billy against Jamie, which is a contender of the year, it's actually been nominated by the board for a contender of the year. So we were really proud of all that. Probably the best learning we've had is the background bits around cost. So I've worked in sales pretty much most of my life. So I like to think I'm a negotiator and a bit of a wheeler and dealer and a geezer. <laughs> yeah. That would work. Yeah. Look, looking back, the prices I paid on certain things that I've now got different companies doing are a hell of a lot cheaper, but it's all about learning. You know, I've made mistakes and I think in anything, I always think that I don't mind making mistakes because the best thing that happens is you learn from it. If it's a financial one, it can hurt a little bit, but we just learn as each fight goes on. So that preparing now the York Hall one and the Cardiff one, which we're doing, we know everything that we've already done on the Brentwood one. And by the time we finish the next Brentwood one, we'll have more learning for when we do the Maidstone one. Like you said, mate, if it was easy, everyone would be doing it. What about the hardest thing about it all? Because like, I, I was sitting there thinking earlier, like all the things you've got to do, like fighting, even down to the lights, the music, you know, have the media stuff, like, you know, like when I was reaching out to you before, just and obviously there's you know hundreds of things that I don't think about because I'm you know I don't do what you do but what's the hardest thing about uh, boxing uh, promotion it's a really good question it's probably the time Tom if I'm honest because as I said I work full time and I can't afford not to because I'm not making money this is a hobby for me so finding time and then having those sacrifices also trying to find the time to build those relationships. Because I think that the way we've done it with all the fighters, like the first one in Northampton, we used to go to the gyms where the lads were in every week. So they felt like we were part of their team. But that was just our first one. Then when you've got a Brentwood show where you've got 12 different fighters on there and they're all scattered all over Kent and Essex, and yeah, I get two days off a week and I have to take time with the family and the kids and stuff like that. How do you really get that time to do it? So that's probably the biggest challenge because I want them to think that we, we care about the fighters rather than just turn up and put on a show i think as well you know it sounds like you've got a lot of pride in what you do and that's clear because of the you know the brentwood uh, show that we went to and i'm sure equally the other ones were as good but obviously i only went to the brentwood so far and something i really want to find out from you is how the tickets work because we speak to lots of fighters that want the exposure to help sell tickets we speak to fighters that lose money um, because they, they can't sell enough or just fighters that don't have that sort of social media presence. So how does it work? If I'm first on the card, second on the card, or I'm, you know, uh, Jamie Robertson, I'm fighting on the main event. How does it work with how many tickets per fight has got to sell? Mm, it's a good question. So that's really important for us, Tom, when we're assembling a card. Now, you just touched on it around some fighters lose money. I've seen many a fight. some that spring straight to mind now they're a fantastic prospect and could go on to english british level in my opinion yet they struggle to sell 10 tickets yeah. and then they probably don't make it in the sport because that's the dark side of the business for a fighter a fighter is a prize fighter they get in a ring and they're either brilliant at knocking people out or fantastic at being elusive or whatever their style is but ideally if they can't sell tickets they're going to struggle to get on a card because we give a very generous, what we think is generous, because some promoters don't give as much. We give 50-50. So the fighter would sell their tickets and that money goes into a pot. They would take 50% and then the house takes 50% towards all the bills, um, which is why we pretty much make nothing. And some fighters that might do, you know, I don't mind saying, some fighters will do 10 grand worth of tickets. We've had some that have done 15 grand. I've then had some that have done 700, 600. Now the opponent, might cost 15, 1600 pounds. So if a fighter only sells seven, 800 pounds worth of tickets, that goes into the pot, the opponent needs paying. So the fighter's not gonna pay the opponent. So then we would have to pay the opponent. So we do have to be strategic around what I would do in an ideal world is put on the best fighters. So I have the best shows and the best prospects, which is my number one priority. But equally, there are some fighters that we look at and go, we can probably get him. Yeah. And on every show we've had so far, we've made a management joint decision between Aaron and myself, if that's the right way of putting it, around this fight might cost us X amount of money. 
but do we see what we're getting back in return? And we might make a calculated risk that says, well, do you know what? If it's going to cost us 800 quid of our pocket to put him on, but we know he's amazing or this might happen, then actually we see it as a good risk. Does that make sense? But you couldn't do that on everybody. And then equally, you'll have some fighters that just put loads in the pot because they're very popular. You mentioned social media presence. Some boxers, I was having a debate with Abdul about it earlier. He just didn't get it. Some boxers don't even have an open Instagram account. You know, you have to request to follow them. Yeah. And Abdul's like, I just don't get it. And I was like, well, to be fair, that's their choice. You know, it's social media is a quite a personal thing. You know, it's very public. People can see what maybe they don't want people to see it. But his argument is, yeah, but if I'm a fighter, the more people that follow me and the more people that can see me on pads and working out, the more popular I'll get and the more social media presence I'll have, which I think he's spot on. Um, and some just aren't very good at it. And others are amazing. They'll tag in me every five minutes. They'll be tagging in the whole world. So they know their videos are out there everywhere. So they get more exposure. I couldn't agree with you more. I mentioned the no names. I've, I've interviewed people on the channel and I put little snippets on Instagram, obviously, you know, to try and get people to go through and watch the full interview. I tag them in. Some fighters will just not, you know, repost it, won't share it, won't even mention it's on there. And obviously I don't say anything because of course, you know, you don't want to burn any bridges. But mm -hmm. it, that always baffles me because if you're, and th th these are probably fighters as well that probably would, you know, could do with the extra exposure. And I, I, I don't get it because I know everyone, you know, not, not everyone wants to be in social media 24 seven, but if you, if there's that pressure on you to sell tickets, because if you can't sell a ticket, you can't fight. It, it does surprise me. But then on the other hand, you'll get people that have got a massive social media come into boxing uh, maybe at a later age, but, but then we'll get on a big show because they'll they'll sell 200 tickets. Yeah, you're spot on. Abdul was speaking to a fighter earlier um, and he was basically saying, you need to pretty much make it an open account because if you don't do it, you're not going to have as much exposure. Yeah, no, of course. It's, it is. It is not. Um, when I was doing what you were doing now before, I used to think exactly the same as you and I was thinking I can't push them because I don't want them to tell me to piss off. Yeah. <laughs> as the promoter, it's my job to support them because the more tickets they sell, first and foremost, they make more money. Secondly, we'll have money to pay the bills. So we definitely try and educate them with them. And some, as you say, are just naturally gifted at it or good at it. I do have some fighters that don't like it, but maybe their dad runs the account or their mum runs the account, very similar with tickets. I can yeah. think of a couple of lads that don't sort the tickets out themselves, but they sell bundles because mum and dad are really popular in the town or the community they're at, and they know exactly what needs to be done. And I love it when I hear that from fighters because I think you know what, fighters should be pra practising and learning their craft and just focusing on the training camp so that they're in the best place possibly, not just physically, but mentally. When I hear that fighters are sort of like panicking a week before I go and collect money and they're like, I need to sell more tickets, I'm thinking they're probably just stressing themselves out. So again, that's probably the dark side of the, the small hall promotions that you know that wouldn't happen on an eddie or a frank or a sky sports show they go for the best fighters that make their shows great but to get to go on one of those shows you've got to start off at the small hall and if you can't sell the tickets it's hard for the small hall promoters to justify putting you on yeah and no, i was speaking with jordan perkis i speak to him quite a lot he's a really good lad of course fighting on your show and yeah, good he's quite he's quite fortunate he's he's obviously you know yeah very likable you can see why he sells a lot of tickets and he says you know it's something he doesn't struggle with and i spoke to um, a welsh lad he's he's um, got his pro debut coming up very shortly i think he sold 150 tickets like you know comfortably and we were talking he said it's such a a pressure just lifted off his shoulders because I couldn't imagine, you know, you wake up at six, go for a run, do a couple of sessions, and then in the evening you've got to sit there and try and self-promote. It, it must be hard when you do struggle to sell a ticket because, like, you know, just, you know, you want you want that social media presence, but you don't want to sort of badger too many people, whereby, on the other hand, if you can get, you know, a fight announced and you can do 100, 150 tickets, it must be a nice feeling. Yeah, and you're right. It must be really hard for the fighter if they're not naturally gifted at it, right? So I like to think that I was made for promoting. That's why I do it. I know how to, you know, do the right things to put the right show on and promote the show. But if you ask me at the end of the day to go and do six rounds worth of sparring, look at me. <laughs> I'll yeah. probably last about six <laughs> seconds. So it, it's probably the same thing. And again, I think we talked off camera. Some people, when you interview fighters, they're more nervous about talking to you on Zoom than they are getting in a ring and being punched because... 
it's that social media world, that platform you're putting them on of YouTube. Whilst they know they need it, they're out of their comfort zone. So it is sad for some of them, but it is what it is. And how do you, you know, get the boxers on the show? Is it because as you sort of um, touched upon earlier, your relationships you built up doing the, the media work before? Yeah, that's exactly it, Tom. So there's some, I could sit here and name drop or just give them a shout out, but I've got some really strong relationships that I've kind of built from day dot, if you like, that allow me to go and say, look, can I have some of your fighters, please? So, you know, Martin Bowers in the Peacock Gym, the first one I had, you know, that's world famous, that Peacock Gym, who, who, you know, Frank Bruno used to train in there, Lennox Lewis used to train in there. You could go through a list of names in there at the moment they've got. But I knew him really well from doing what I do with you that I was like, right, I'm promoting. Can I have one of your lesser fighters that don't get out on TV? And he was like, of course you can. And I was like, wow. Then I've managed to build a great relationship with, say, Lee Eaton, for example. So Lee's got 60, 70 great fighters. Majority of them are top, top prospects. And the majority of them are good ticket sellers. You know, it's very much about relationship building because they need to trust that you're going to put on a good show and that you're going to look after their fighters. Hence why we give them a good split of money compared to other promoters and that we're happy to invest whatever profit we might make back into production. You know, you mentioned around the ring walks and don't always get a production like that at the lower level. And we're proud that we've done that, but that eats into the profit. Yeah, someone was telling me about a show recently and the the card was, it was like someone would have a fight, they would get announced and then there was nothing in between and the fighters were, it was just so, so quick. Um, and the show, I think, finished at like 10 o'clock, which for some people, that's great. But when, you know, going back to your show, you had the fight, you had a little bit of music in between the ring walk. So there was a, it felt like quite a, a smooth sort of transition from one to the other. Yeah. And that's what we're trying to achieve. You know, when I mentioned about we, uh, number one, we want to look after fighters because they've got to come back on our shows. But number two, we want to look after fans. You know, we ask the fighters to sell tickets to their friends and family. The friends and family have got a part with their hard earned money. You know, some ticket prices are 50 quid, 70 quid, 100 quid, 100 pound. You could go and get a really good seat at an Eddie Hearn show, yet you're paying 100 pound to watch one of your best mates fight. So they definitely deserve the best value they can get. And whether that's production, whether that's music, or even if it's just 50 50 fights. I want the fans to leave there going, wow, that was a great night. So that they want to come back. And how, when, when you're at the event, how, how much do you actually enjoy it? Because I imagine you're quite conscious and making sure the fights are good. Everyone's having a good time. It's running smoothly. How much do you actually get to enjoy it? Yeah, it's, that's a good question. Cause it's very stressful on the night in an ideal world. That old thing is, it's, it's a boxing analogy. All the training is done in the gym. In the, in the camp, you should just go in and just win the fight. So it almost feels like we should go there and enjoy it, have a few interviews with you guys and publicise it and watch some great fights. But to put it into reality, I'll give you an example. Our last event in Cardiff, we had, to, I don't know people in Cardiff, so it was a brave call for us to go down there. I was taking friends and family as part of my team that come and help me. Um, I had two people who were going to be running the door to collect tickets. One of them was sick, so they couldn't come. Genuinely didn't deliberately let us down. So yeah. I live near a lunder end or well midlands where i live in milton Keynes now but going all the way down to to cardiff when that other person was ill the other one then didn't come so aaron and i we stood on the door for three hours checking tickets the two promoters were on the door missing the bus. but it's quite humble you know and again people were like the promoters were on the door and i was like well why wouldn't we be you know we have to muck in that's excessive uh but at northampton and brentwood we were still running around uh, brentwood uh, i think aaron come up to me and he went we got a real problem and i looked at him and like, that's like a real problem I'm like what is it and he was like lenny fuller's opponent's not here and, like, and it was about half hour 45 minutes before lenny fuller's wing walk i was like what do you mean he's not here and then <laughs> yeah. we'd realized he was a foreigner with foreigner we'd picked him up from the airport took him to the way in dropped him back which idiot me forgot to pick him up because we were so busy <laughs> and they didn't even know where the venue was because they weren't from England. But he, he, he managed to get there and he turned up and then the, the manager was having a go at me saying, you haven't picked us up. We've had to pay for taxis from the hotel. So yeah, it, it can it can get very stressful, but I've got a good family around me as well and friends that fortunately they, they want me to do well. They know that I can't pay them. So they all sort of like muck in uh, on, on fight night. And even in the lead up there, they'll sort of like ferry fighters around from, airports and hotels and help on the door and help on the bar and sell tickets on the door that kind of stuff so yeah you're, you're certainly not scared to get your hands dirty and how 
how did you start doing the the, the media work? I know when we spoke to you at, in in Brentwood, you you said um, you you know you've done a lot of work for I think the Boxing Voice. How did that all come about? Mm-hmm. Yeah, a really good friend of mine, um, one of my best friends now, actually, he worked for the same company that I do. Um, and he joined about three years ago. And I was looking after him, I think, in his first, second week. And like you do when you're getting to know people, he was like, oh, I'm a boxing fan. And you know what it's like when you meet someone who says that. I'm thinking, here we go. He's going to tell me he loves Joshua or Amir Khan or something. You know? <laughs> anyway, within about 30 seconds, I was like, OK, he's a proper fan. But he worked for the Boxing Voice and he was like why don't you come along i can get you doing some interviews and weigh-ins and press conferences and i was like wow so that's dave johow and i'll give him a big shout out because if it wasn't for him i wouldn't have come in the sport and again i like to look after those who look after me so dave johow is now my main commentator at my events so he's reached out i mean he's interviewed household names galore he interviews eddie hearn every event and he interviews frank warren every event he, you know it doesn't matter who he was at the fury fight he had accreditation interviewed everybody but um, for him to sit there commentating our last show at Brentwood, you were there, but we had Dan Aziz and Denzel Bentley. He had the British light heavyweight on one shoulder and the ex-British middleweight champion on the other. And he sat there commentating with him. And I was like, well, why wouldn't I look after you? You looked after me. So, And, and Love Island stars. Yes, we had Mr. Idris Burgo <laughs> there as well. And again, that was strategic. You know, we've got all the people that were there at the last one. They're all, I would say, friends. Denzel and I, I've known Denzel for years now. I've interviewed Denzel about 15, 20 times, similar to Dan. So I know them well. Idris, I knew well as well. So I sort of like reached out and said, how do you feel coming to be part of our commentary team? Because I know that it looks good for me. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't do it. But equally, some of these people like doing it like Denzel for example as soon as I asked him he was like yeah that's wicked and I knew he'd love it because he loves anything media related and I think sometimes for some fighters like Dan Aziz in particular taking nothing away from Denzel Dan Aziz is one of the most articulate boxers you'll come across he's very clever he's very educated as well out of the ring um you know maybe he might have a career in media afterwards so for them it could be a first stepping stone because when once them boxers end their career they've still got to earn money unless you're Tyson Fury and earning a hundred million pound a fight or whatever it is, but um, it, it, it's nice for them. Equally, I reached out to one or two people and they were like, John, you're having a laugh. I could never do that. I'd like to help you, but no way. So, you know, horses for courses. Yeah, of course. It's like when we got there, uh, I knew he was going to be there because, you know, you know, from your social media, we had a conversation before, but yeah, really nice, you know, really nice bloke. He jumped on, jumped on our channel. And we had a little chat about Love Island boxing and a, uh, and a few other things as well. So going forward, um, obviously you're doing some great things at the moment, but what sort of like, you know, a couple of years plan, five years plan, you know, what, what sort of level were you looking to get to? So I'm an ambitious guy anyway. You can tell I'm passionate and Aaron's the same. We're, we're going back to when we're talking about money, if we wanted to cut the production, for example, we could make a bit of money, a little bit on the side, on top of your job and just tick along. But I think both of us would love to maybe make it a bit bigger and someone one day someone has to have tv deals so you know two years three years down the line i'd love it if someone sort of like acknowledged the shows the more we put on like the one you've said the better quality of fighters we'll get the better quality of fighters we get the better uh, uh, cards they are uh, and then maybe someone will go give them a chance i mean from our first ever event to the second one we had an english title fight on my second one, which was Billy Allenton against Jamie Robinson. And I remember, again, thank you to Martin Bowers and Lee Eaton. It was one of their fighters against the other. So without those, I might not have pulled that off. Um, and I was like, I've got an English title fight on my second one. Now back, then we had a Celtic title at the next one, which was in Cardiff. And now back at Brentwood, we've got an English title because Billy Allenton's defending his title, which is great for us. And he's a good friend of ours. But we've just added last week, you may have seen Nina Hughes, who fights for the Commonwealth title. Yeah, she was on the channel last week. Yeah, really lovely lady. She is lovely. Uh, you know, time's not with her. I think she's 39. I watched her at your call a couple of weeks ago on a Lee Eaton show, and she is different class. We know who she spars, um, and we know how well she does in the gym because we've seen it and heard it. So they say sparring stories stay in the gym, so we'll leave them in there. But should she come through this Commonwealth title fight, and we fully expect her to do it, then hopefully she'll be fighting for a world title by the end of the year. We're never going to get a world title on our card, but wouldn't it be fantastic for Aaron and I to turn around and say, we had her last time, she's now on Sky Sports or she's on an Eddie show, same weight as Shannon Courtney, Ebony Bridges. I think she beats both of those, but maybe I'm a bit biased. Well, you're definitely going in the right direction, but I think you're 100% right. You know, you look at the landscape of boxing over the last year or so, one minute you've got Sky and Eddie Hearn, this huge sort of monster machine and sort of taken over. All of a sudden, Eddie Hearn takes his stable to DAZN. Frank Warren obviously putting on a massive event the other night. Ben Shalom working with Boxer. 
um, Sam Jones moving on and creating something different or working for a different company, should I say. So the landscape's always changing and, you, you know, you never know what's around the corner. Yeah, exactly that. I think that Ed, Eddie's probably... I'm a bit of an Eddie fanboy. Well, my missus tells me I'm an Eddie fanboy. I'm like, no, I'm not. She goes, you know you are. I think if you go back. <laughs> Is that your poster? 12, in the yeah, pretty much. Yeah, I've got his book. Uh, 12, 12, 13 years ago, maybe 14, when he sort of like came on the scene and he had Dordy Harrison first. And then I think he had Darren Barker, Carl Frotch, Kel Brook. The way he sort of like escalated. And as much as I love Frank Warren, probably just as much as Eddie, he kind of was the modern one. He did the events rather than just the boxing show. Uh, and he'd taken it to a new level. And obviously he then got the opportunity need to go to the zone i dread to think how much money that contract was worth so i'm damn sure it was the right decision for eddie and his matchroom team to take that um you know i see some negative stuff about eddie saying are we slipping blah blah blah. i'm not sure he is i just think that he's focusing a lot on america and probably his big cash cows are now focused on people like saul alvarez maybe rather than some of the ones over here so if you're a brit and you like the british scene it might not be you know, you're not seeing eddie on those shows as much i do think one thing and i'm sure eddie considered it but my opinion with Sky Sports, those that have Sky Sports and the majority of people that do have it because of football. So boxing comes with it. Obviously, your diehard boxing fans would have it. Yeah. But if you've got Sky Sports, you have Sky Sports News as a platform. Johnny Nelson, your Adam Smith, all these people, Eddie Hearn, the fighters in the studio. When I was looking at the build up of the Kelbrook um, Amir Khan fight, which was obviously Shalom. It was on every advert yeah, and yeah. every 10 minutes they're interviewing someone and it just builds up the hype. And I think Eddie's lost that platform now and he's obviously only on a subscription only channel. So, you know, I've got friends who are diehards that just don't pay for it. Um, so that must be a challenge. But you're, you're right. You know, Ben Shalom came in there and to be fair, the doors opened and he's done a great job there. You know, he, he, some people would argue that some of his shows are even better than what Eddie was doing. And I think Frank's sort of like, revitalized as well if i look at the stables i look at frank's stable and i think domestically it's a hell of a lot better than eddie's in my opinion and sky seem to be snapping up all the young talent that are real talent like springs to mind i know them well the azim brothers really really strong it amazes me while they haven't been signed by eddie because that would almost have been a slam dunker three, four years ago. No one would have got near them, but it's good. Rivalry's good and it's competition. You know, and there's lots of different platforms. You've got uh, Wasserman have got the Channel 5 contract as well now. So uh, I think that the Warrens, the Freddie Warrens, Alfie Warren and Sonny Warren, they've got Box Nation now with Mark Nielsen. So it's all over the place and we want a piece of the pie eventually. As fans, we're definitely sport. But, you know, you talking about Frank Warren it always makes me laugh when he refers to Eddie Hearn's app. But yeah, I think, you know, I agree with you. You can't take away what Eddie Hearn's done. You know, you've only got to look at his personal profile. Bar, you know, a few boxers, he's, you know, his personal profile is huge. Is, you know, talking about stables and for what you do, is it something you'd ever consider down the line to have in your own stable to, to obviously make it easier for you to, you know, fill cards? Or is that not something you, you know, you really want to get into? I think you'd be mad to say no. But funnily enough, I've been saying no about it now for a while. And in the short term, I'll tell you why. When you talked about assembling cards, I know some good friends who are local small hall promoters doing the same as what Aaron and I do that manage 40, 50, 60 fighters as well. So when they put a show on, their number one priority is to get their own fighters out. Sometimes those fighters might not be the best ticket sales that we've talked about, but they've got an obligation to get them out, yeah. which then means, or they might not even be, as good as some of the other fighters out there, which sometimes then makes the show not as good. Whereas myself, but I don't have an obligation or a commitment that I have to put any fighter on my shows. Because if I was a promoter with a management stable, they'd be like, why are you putting Lee Eaton's fella on or Martin Bowers fella on when you're not putting me on? And actually, if you were the fighter, you'd be right to challenge that. So that allows Aaron and I to cherry pick might be the right phrase, but I can go to Lee and go, right, I've got a show. Can I have five or six of your fighters? It's like, where is it? When is it? Right, let me see who's due out. And then we'll have a chat. And then you can put on better shows. And I think that's probably the answer as to why our shows have been so successful. Um, but equally, when you're managing fighters, you, you make money and you take a percent of that. And, and it's their job to get them on shows. So it would be naive to say never. But at the moment, we're quite happy just doing what we're doing. Yeah, no, from what you're saying, it makes complete sense. And uh, yeah, cherry pick or whatever word you want to call it, it, it you know, makes sense as well. You know, you can go around promoters, um, sorry, managers, 
uh, gyms and really sort of focus on the, on the fights you want. Because of course, if you've got a stable full of fighters and they haven't got that profile, it's going to be hard to make any money. Yeah, definitely. Um, but as I said, we just enjoy doing it the way it is. But yeah. So away from boxing, when you get five minutes to yourself, what do you enjoy doing? Uh, watching boxing, probably. <laughs> <laughs> you never switch off. No, well, it is hard because, as I mentioned earlier, if you've got a full-time job and I have a demanding job that probably takes 50 hours of my week out, I probably spend 20 hours of my week sorting boxing stuff. So if you put the two together, the rest is probably sleeping. But I've got kids. I love the kids and the missus, and we make sure that we get as what we can, even if it's just going out to a restaurant or spending a bit of time with them, something silly like a board game or something that I do appreciate. We just went away for a week to Devon last week. I didn't take any work stuff because I was off. Um, but I clearly took the boxing stuff and there was a lot going on last week. And every day I was on the phone for like two hours and they were just looking at me and I was like, just let me get on with it. But I'm very lucky that they understand that A, they're letting me live my dream and B, that maybe one day daddy can, I can say, oh, daddy's got a bit more money or daddy's this or whatever. So it's worth trying. Do you find it hard to switch off then? Yeah, very hard. I'm quite hyperactive as a person. You can probably tell that from the interview anyway, Tom, but I'm 100 mile an hour in pretty much anything I do. So I think that's good, though, because, and I thought this about Aaron, Aaron's quite fast paced as well. If if you're going to try and have a full time job and then be a boxing promoter with the work, I'm not sure you find the time to just chill out. It just isn't there. Um, so you know, it probably suits that I can do it because of that. Yeah, no, you know, your passion definitely comes across and I think again, like I said earlier, you know, you're you're passionate about you what you do and you want to put on good shows. So naturally, you know, you spend a lot of time doing it. But listen, mate, on that note, I know you are a very busy man. But as I said to you when I um you know before we got you on tonight, it, we did speak in Brentwood. However, it was quite short because it was just on on the day. But I wanted to get you on because just to you know find out a little bit more about you, your route into you know the the media stuff, how you got into the promotional promotional side. And, you know, what's next and just how you sort of reflect on the shows, you know, you've done so far. But we wish you all the best going forward. You know, we look forward to seeing you in Brentwood on the 4th of June. And again, for anyone that wants to go and watch a good night of boxing, uh, definitely buy a ticket. Top man, thanks for the promotion. Look, great interview and thanks for your time as well, mate. I appreciate it, Tom, and I'll catch you soon, mate. Yeah, you're very welcome. Take care, John. All the best, mate. Thanks a lot.